Hello. Can you see me and hear me? Oh, you can. Okay, good. So it looks like this is working. Okay, so it's the usual fumbling around as I start a live stream. Okay. Well, hi, cats and kittens, lizards and iguanas, people of all stripes. Um, I'm going to answer all your questions, or at least I'm going to try to. And I'll start this off with uh, just a quick announcement, which is that the channel is inching ever closer to 50,000 subscribers. So if you're following my channel and you're enjoying it, don't hesitate to spread the word and tell people about it because it would be so cool to get to 50,000. That's a real milestone that I've been working towards for a while now. And I think we're at 49,450 or something like that. So that's pretty cool. I think uh, in a few days, we'll probably get to 50,000. So thank you to everybody who's subscribing and let's try to get it to 50K. So there's lots of people already here. That's really cool. Um, the other thing that I'll quickly point out is that I put up a new video quite recently about Beethoven. Maybe some of you have seen that. And I've got quite a few others in the works. So I took a bit of a break over the summer for various reasons, partly because I was recording a, a CD project and I wasn't posting a lot on YouTube for a couple of months, but the Beethoven video is up now. And the next ones I'm going to be working on, I'm going to be doing a video on the topic of procrastination and specifically procrastination with respect to artists, which I think is uh, going to be interesting to do. And I'm also going to do an analysis video on Hugo Wolf and a few other things. So you'll see. And F. Morello writes, any updates on the new record? Greetings from Vienna. Well, greetings to Vienna from Alsace. So yes, the update on the new record. So the, uh, the recordings were finished by late June in terms of the initial studio recordings. And since then, I've been working with a recording engineer in Switzerland who's doing all of the editing and mixing. And we're working on that together. And right now we have rough mixes for everything. And we are currently in the phase of just tightening everything up and preparing the final master. So that does take a bit of time. But we expect that the master will be done within probably three or four weeks at the most. And from that point on, I'll be working together with the label on the design and the whole release strategy and all of that, everything that goes into putting out a record. And the timing for the project, I would expect it to be out by about March at the latest, March 2023. So, and I'm, I'm very conscious of this record, by the way, as being something that I'm particularly proud of and I would like a lot of people to hear. So we're gonna work very, very carefully and assiduously on communicating this release and doing a very good job with that. Um, not that we didn't try with the previous releases, but I've got a few CDs under my belt and I have a, a better idea of the stages involved in releasing music now. And I would really like this one to uh, get a very broad distribution and not only in the sort of contemporary classical or new music world, but, but something much broader than that. So that's what we're aiming for. 
So, any thoughts on separating the art from the artist? That is great music from not so great people. Oh boy, that's complicated. That's a complicated question. My tendency is to say that we should look at the work and evaluate it on its own autonomous terms as much as possible. Sometimes some context is needed in order to understand the work and what it came out of historically and what it what it's pointing to and what it connects to. But I don't believe that the personal biographical details of the artist are always relevant to appreciating the work itself. Sometimes they are relevant, but not automatically. And I think that if you have to start separating out the people who were not so fantastic, you know, from the history of music, then I don't know who would be left with respect to the classical canon, you know, because it's very easy to find fault in people, <clears throat> especially centuries later. And I don't think that those sorts of considerations should necessarily enter into our evaluation of the music itself. But that's a very hot topic right now, especially in musicological circles. So have you ever listened to any music from Iran? I have actually. I've, I've, I've listened to the music of Iranian composers, and I'm very interested in it. But I have to confess, I don't know the traditional music of Iran very well. And that's something that I would like to know more about. So uh, Tristan Scott says, could you briefly explain how you analyze experimental works such as what you did for Gesang der Jünglinge? I'm enamored by complexity and where one would even start to understand such a piece. Yeah, well, that's one of the tricky things about analysis is you want to take something that's really quite complex and has an almost infinite number of angles to it and collapse it down into something that you can start to parse. And so a lot of the work of analysis is actually simplifying and, uh, and boiling concepts down to their essence. And in order to do that, you need a few things. You need a developed critical sense so that you, you can intuit relatively quickly what are the most interesting or significant features of a piece, or what are the features at least that you'd like to focus on? And you also need to know the piece very well. I mean, very, very well. So a lot of, uh, there's a mistake that's that's very easy to make, which is that you want to analyze a piece. So you immediately go and get a hold of the score and start, you know, start reading through it. And I don't think that's necessarily the ideal approach. I think it's probably better to start by listening to a recording of the piece many times or multiple recordings if possible, if that exists, and make a kind of mental map of the world of the piece, of its structure, of its landscape, so that you can hold the whole piece in your head, so to speak, as a, as a kind of a landscape that you can survey at a glance, you know, with all of its peaks and valleys and all of that. Start with that, start by getting to know it very well as a piece of music. And then at that point, you can open up the score and start doing a more text-based based analysis. But I think it's very, very useful to emphasize what I would call a phenomenological analysis of music, which is, in other words, the, what is the experience of listening to it like? And start there. So that's kind of a complicated response to your question, but. And Parsa writes, I will share, I will share some Iranian music with you. Well, thank you. I would, I would enjoy that. Actually, I would like to hear some. How do you deal with analysis paralysis when trying to make a piece in a genre you're not as familiar with as you are with others? Well, that's a hard question to answer because when I'm writing a piece. I mean, speaking from my own experience, I'm usually trying to figure out a map of a, of a territory that I don't know at all. And, and I, I don't know where I am. I don't know where the piece is going to lead me. And that's 
but that's sort of the point, you know, because that's my greatest joy in composition is the element of surprise, not knowing where I'm going to go and figuring that out as I go along. I mean, obviously I have a, a certain technical baggage that I carry with me, I suppose, or I have a, I have a technique that, that I've refined over the decades, but each individual piece is an individual piece and has its own world and things that it wants to say. And I try to find out what those things are through the process of writing. So being an artist is, you know, it involves being very close to ambiguity and mystery and unformed potential and intuiting shapes out of nothing, out of the ether, so to speak. So I think that will be the case whether you're writing in a familiar genre or not. What composers do you recommend if someone likes Brian Ferniho and Michael Finnessy, i.e. really complex classical music? Well, I think lots of music has its own form of complexity. Mozart is very complex. Um, the opening bars of the Eroica Symphony by Beethoven are ridiculously complex. It takes a long time to understand what's going on in the first few seconds of the Eroica. You know, that's that's complexity. Complexity for me means that there are multiple independent strands in the piece that are interacting in unpredictable ways. That's all it means. I think that's what complexity is. And many pieces have that feature. You know, if a piece is completely predictable and, uh, you know, you can, you can more or less extrapolate where it's going based on the first few seconds, then there might not be much depth to that piece. But if you like those really wild textures, those pieces that are, you know, really virtuosic and crazy and uh, exciting to listen to, then you might start by listening to the late romantics. People like, um, List in particular is definitely undervalued and not mentioned frequently enough. I think in this kind of a context, he wrote music that is incredibly forward thinking, but also some sort of outliers like Charles Valentin Alcan, A L K A N, who was a French virtuoso pianist who wrote uh, really quite odd music that is virtually unplayable some of it i mean it's only accessible to the most uh, insane virtuosos it's really quite difficult and quite spectacular to listen to so i was wondering if you had any ideas of recording breakdowns of any zappa piece especially something on absolutely free or uncle meat or the late orchestral stuff he introduced me to classical and by the way, I'm not a composer or anything with little knowledge of concepts, but I found your channel out through the Frownland video and Drumbo interview. So I haven't done a Zappa video, that's true, and I'm often asked why that is. It's partly a matter of taste, I have to say. And that might sound funny coming from somebody who's done, you know, all those Beefheart interviews and the and the Frownland video, but I never particularly gravitated to Zappa, personally. The expressive climate and the, uh, the personality, the artistic personality of Frank Zappa is something that is really quite alien to me, for the most part. So I've listened to a lot of it, and I've enjoyed a lot of it. Uh, I think Uncle Meat is a remarkable album, for sure. I really like a lot of the Mother's stuff but it's not something that I feel compelled to do a video on. So, and other people have done that and done a really good job on it, by the way. There's lots of videos on Frank Zappa and, that you can find on YouTube. Have you met a genuine Kenny G fan yet? No, I haven't. I kind of hoped that my video would actually get some outraged responses from genuine Kenny G fans, but so far not a single one has turned up. That's kind of interesting, eh? I mean, you know, not that the video got millions of views or anything, but I would have thought that 
I think 8,000 people watched it or something. I would have thought one of them would be a genuine Kenny G fan and would be, you know, upset that I was, <laughs> that I was uh, criticizing their hero. And not that I was criticizing him, by the way, because I really don't think that was the point of the video at all. Uh, the point of the video for me was, you know, my, my sort of genuine confusion as to what that phenomenon is all about. And I was trying to, in real time, I suppose, think through that question. Because obviously there are lots of people that like that music. And, um, but it's very, it's very alien to me. And, you know, that's something I said in the video. I think it's really useful to investigate things that you either don't understand or, or viscerally dislike or, or that uh, at least fall outside of the range of things you would normally listen to and try to see what makes them tick and, you know, how they're put together and all of those sorts of things. You can really learn a lot by doing that. But anyway, no, I haven't met a genuine Kenny G fan yet, at least not knowingly. Do you have a more intuitive or procedural slash technical approach to composition? Well, see, I don't think those things are antinomical. I think that that any composer has some some kind of a blend of the two. You need both of those faculties, and they need to be in some kind of balance to each other in order to function as a as an artist. If you're completely intuitive, then you might think about what that means to be completely intuitive. It might mean that you're relying too much on your own memory, you know, because that's partly what intuition is. And if you're relying too much on your own memory, then you might not be pushing yourself hard enough. You might not be deliberately putting yourself into situations where your intuition no longer works because you're in a, a new environment. And you, you have to sort of figure out what the rules of this new environment are. And that can be enormously stimulating for an artist. So sometimes deliberately engaging in uh, arbitrary constraints or, you know, or working on a specific technical problem can, can help to expand the work and to uh, increase the quotient of surprise that goes into it. So those things need to be in, in some measure of balance. If, if it's too technical, obviously that's not good either. You know, if, you're, if you find yourself dealing with very abstract concepts all of the time and you're getting too far from embodied an embodied experience of music, then you might end up writing music that is meaningless, right? That's a, there's twin dangers that have to be avoided. Talking about CDs, any thoughts on Kairos or more generally on the landscape of contemporary classical labels? Unfortunately, there are very few, despite the tons of great works that are being premiered. Yes, there's very few. There are reasons for that. It's extremely difficult to monetize recordings of compositions. I mean, it's, it's difficult to monetize any form of recorded music now because of the advent of streaming audio and, uh, and MP3s before that. So, but extremely difficult isn't the same as impossible. It's not impossible. There are ways to do it, but it's difficult. And, uh, you know, if, and the, the, the average CD of, of new music, you know, you can be quite certain that it's not going to recoup its costs. So that's why there's not many of them. But I don't, I don't see that fatalistically. I think that that's actually something that is possible to do something about. Part of it has to do with the way they're marketed and and the way the you know the whole the whole way that this music is is typically disseminated, which is actually very very narrow. So that was a, a choice that we made going into this new CD project, which was that we didn't want to do something that would be exclusively visible in some kind of new music world but that it would be much broader and hopefully get a broader public than that. So I'm getting really behind in these questions. Uh, 
Um, I've recently been at a live talk with Klaus Stefan Mankopf about AI in the arts. And the next day, David Bruce uploaded a video on that topic. How do you think AI will impact the arts and especially music? And maybe also what are some of your hopes and concerns about the development of the interaction of AI and arts and the impact on human artists? So far, I haven't seen anything in the AI realm that I think is a major game changer. So far. But it's very hard to extrapolate how that's going to develop over the next few years because technology is moving at such an incredibly rapid pace now. When I say nothing that is a major game changer, obviously there have been quite spectacular advances in technology. So for example, the text to image translations that you see now are really quite impressive, uh, but you can also do it in the other direction. So there are AI programs now that can take an image and, and that can generate a text that describes what's going on in the image and not just describe it in a kind of elemental manner, but in a manner that seems to belie some form of understanding about, about what the text, what, about what the, the image is saying and what the hidden symbolism might be. And, and it's often quite sophisticated and quite surprising. So those things are impressive, but basically what's going on there is there's just a, an enormous number of, uh, of inputs and the, the AI is just doing an extremely good job of moving through all of those inputs at incredible speed and evaluating them and, and uh, comparing them basically with, with, uh, with other pieces of information. So, as I understand it, and I'm by no means an expert on AI, but as I understand it, these programs are not involved in knowledge creation or artistic creation for that matter either, uh, but they're creating essentially a kind of extremely sophisticated pastiche that is able to move very, very quickly and, uh, and sort of trawl through an enormous amount of information at lightning speed. But, that's not exactly what a human artist does. So I would be impressed when it gets to a point where you get a, a form of invention, a form of invention that is really genuinely surprising. And that doesn't necessarily depend upon the inputs that are, that are being provided. But, you know, art isn't simply a matter of, uh, finished works, it's also a process. It's a process that we all engage in. And, you know, Duchamp's whole idea was that the artist is one part of that process, but the, the audience participates in it as well. And there isn't always a, a, a firm line in the sand between those two things. So the audience participates in the creation of meaning by, by engaging with the work. And I don't know, you know, if AI really touches upon that realm. There's the other thing about AI with respect to music that I think is interesting is that the way that it's been presented to the public in some very sort of high profile ways in recent years has been, I think, extremely misleading. So for example, there is a team of musicologists and, and uh, research scientists who decided to see if they could, using AI, if they could produce a performing version of Beethoven's 10th symphony. And this actually got quite a lot of attention. And uh, the piece that resulted was premiered, I think in Germany last year, or was it the year before? I can't remember. Anyway, there is no Be Beethoven's 10th symphony. It doesn't exist. There are sketches, there are, you know, some very fragmentary sketches, but there's not enough to base a piece on. And what the AI did, or what the, the people sort of running the AI did was they, uh, they somehow got the machine to, to produce a, a gigantic mashup of fragments of things that Beethoven did in his previous symphonies, but that's not how artists work. Right, so you can't you can't extrapolate the ninth symphony based upon the eighth. There's it's it's it, the the connection between those two works is 
is too tenuous and too vastly too complex to simply extrapolate on the basis of what happened on the previous symphonies. Like you don't get you don't get the fifth symphony as a kind of logical progression from the fourth. It's not it's not like that. It's not that straightforward. And that's precisely what's interesting about artists is, are the the unpredictable, sudden, mad turns of fancy and invention that occur that are not only inexplicable, but that are not derivable from their previous works. So, so the, the Beethoven 10th symphony that was played was just, you know, a, a very poor, shoddy mashup of fragments of the earlier symphonies and, you know, mixed in with little pieces of the sketches. It's just, uh, I, I was not impressed by that at all. You know, because it, 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 it really takes away the agency of the artist, I think, and it's, it, it cheapens it in a way that I think is, is uh, not good. And then there is the famous doodle that Google put up uh, where you could uh, press a button and it would, or you, you, could, you could put some musical notes on a staff and it would harmonize them in four parts, ostensibly in the style of Bach. But uh, Adam Neely did a video about that. It was pretty hilariously bad. You know, like even, uh, like, I'm sure it would be possible to do it much better than, than happened on that, on that occasion. But I mean, it was like really quite astoundingly terrible. So, So, why do some people only hear unpleasant noises with music like Weber and others like me hear music? You know, I really don't criticize anybody who is unable to enjoy Weber because Weber is difficult. It really is difficult and it's demanding and it's not for everybody. And I don't think in saying that we're sort of admitting that this is a, you know, that you that you have to be a certain type of person or whatever to enjoy Webern or or there's something wrong with you if, if you don't enjoy it. I think it's it's music that comes out of a very particular historic context and a very extreme one. And um, I think it'll be easier to understand if you have some sense of the context within which Weber was working. You know, if you have some understanding of the of the era in which his attitudes were formed. And if you think about what was going on in Vienna in the early decades of the 20th century, it's astounding. You have people like Wittgenstein and Georg Trackel and Freud and Jung and all of these people. Uh, Weber and Schoenberg, Mahler, you know, all those artists, you know, Klimt, uh, just amazing. And all of these people revolutionizing their respective fields simultaneously in ways that, uh, in, in ways that are just so spectacular. And Weber comes out of that. There's a kind of utopianism, I think, that's, uh, that, that, uh, was in the air at that time. So the Webern video that I did, the last one on, on uh, the Opus 11 cello pieces, for some reason it got a, a very substantial number of views in a very short amount of time. Uh, definitely more than average for me. I think it's at about 60,000 views now, which for a video on one of the most challenging pieces by Weber, and I think it's quite surprising that it got that number of views. I'm, I don't know why that happened. It got like five times the number of views that my John Cage video got. So I don't know why. A lot of the comments were negative, actually. Not about the video, but about the piece. A lot of people felt moved to express their um, strong dislike of that piece. So which is interesting, you know, because Webern himself uh, said at one point that you should probably not perform these pieces. He, he was he was actually discouraging performers from programming them uh, for fear that they would be misunderstood. And that's what's happening still a hundred years later, more than a hundred years later. 
they're still being misunderstood and I don't know, don't know what to think about that. In your analyses, you have a good feel for integration of text and certainly read well. Did you study literature or pick it up? Do you consider yourself informed in the area of text or are you winging it? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by the integration of text, Rob, if you're still there. Do you mean the poetry that uh, I sometimes discuss in relation to music, or do you mean literature generally, or I'm not sure what you mean. Maybe if you can clarify the question a little bit, I can come back to that. Oh, and Parsa wrote something interesting here. Let me go back to this. Uh, as a visual artist, I'm already using AI-generated imagery in my work, both as reference for my analog paintings and as textures slash objects in my 3D animations. It's great as a complementary tool. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think if it's used as a tool in tandem with other processes, then it can be definitely very powerful. Uh, I just don't believe that, at least currently, that AI can generate um, artworks, at least in the sense that I understand artworks to be but it could very well be that that's due to my own limited thinking and that I'm about to be ast astonished by the developments that are to come. I'm sure that's true. With the continuing globalization of music, how important are national schools and styles still? Well, I don't know if they're important, but they definitely still exist. There's no question about that. Uh, to a greater or lesser degree in different countries, but they certainly do exist. Absolutely. Why is that? Well, countries aren't all the same. People aren't all the same, and there are different cultures and different languages and different cultural attitudes that are reflected in the music and different priorities as to what artists might think are, are, are valuable things to say. So... So I think it still exists. And language is very tied up to music as well, you know, in, in ways that are difficult to put your finger on. But, you know, the fact of being a native English speaker or a native Italian speaker or a native Spanish speaker or whatever it might be, uh, I'm sure has a more significant impact on your approach to music as a composer than, you know, the specific country that you happen to be from. Okay, and Rob writes, he's referring to the poetry and lyrics. Uh, so I didn't study literature or poetry formally, but uh, I've been engaging very seriously with both for a long time, since my adolescence, if not earlier. And uh, I read a lot, and I'm, I'm very, very interested in poetry. So but I, I don't have any kind of academic background in that. I'm just a, I'm a reader, I'm a passionate reader of poetry and, uh, and it's certainly informed my music over the years as well. So, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna look at a, a piece of music and try to analyze it or try to present it, then it's always a good idea to think about the aesthetic more broadly and how it might relate to other artistic domains such as poetry, literature, cinema, painting, dance, et cetera. It can really help. I've noticed this quite often with my own students that if there is a, a feeling of resistance or incomprehension relating to a particular work, that you know a lot of that incomprehension can be dissipated very rapidly if you just show them a painting that is sort of coming out of the same attitude. So it doesn't mean they'll necessarily like the piece, but. So many questions that I don't know which one to answer next. Let's see. What kind of advice would you give to somebody trying to learn to sight sing? Aha. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of components to sight singing. So one of the things is you you need to have the faculty of hearing something inwardly and being able to externalize it. So in order to be able to sing, I think you have to first be able to imagine or hear the intervals inwardly. In the same sense that if you're a trumpet player and you want to play a certain tone on your instrument and you want it to be in tune, then you actually have to, I think you have to be able to hear the tone inwardly first before you play it. It's not simply a question of having the right valve combination or having the right fingering on a, on a, on a woodwind instrument. You have to be able to hear uh, what you what it is you want to play and then play it. So anyway, sight singing more generally, I think it's incredibly useful for musicians generally to sit down at the keyboard or whatever instrument, but a keyboard is really useful. And just bang out, you know, stacks and stacks of music really badly. Do it badly, like don't be concerned about accuracy necessarily, but just get in the habit of reading quickly and reading lots of music and, um, and try to, you know, try to work on that skill continuously and you'll gradually get better at it. But it's something that you can make into a, a daily practice. You know, a lot of people, when they sit down at their instrument, they'll immediately start doing something that's familiar or that's enjoyable to play or a piece they've already done, you know, hundreds of times. And that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it can be useful for warming up and, you know, getting ready to play. But at a certain point, I think it's really valuable to focus on specifically just reading through things and you can decide what your level is and, you know, how difficult the pieces are that you're going to sight read or sight sing. But uh, that's what I would say about that. Does Beefheart have any significant vocal techniques or stylings? To me, he sounds like an amateur vocalist. Well, if you want to be technical about it, he was he was a professional vocalist because he was paid to sing. So, I mean, what, what do you mean by amateur vocalist exactly? You know, like what about what about the blues singers? You know, like they're they're paid to sing, and I don't know what, what I don't know what is meant by amateur vocalist exactly. It's a it's a technique. There are many ways of approaching singing, um, and I think that the technique he had was pretty well suited to the sorts of things he wanted to do. You know, I probably would not want to hear Captain Beefheart sing the Beatles, but then again, he wouldn't have wanted to sing the Beatles. He had the perfect vocal technique for the sort of music he was making. So there you go. Are you more of a poet or a formalist? Well, that's a strange question. <laughs> it's sort of like saying, are you more similar to a rhinoceros or a carrot? Was uh, Charles Louis Anon, the pianist you mentioned after a list some minutes ago? No, it was Alcan, A L K A N. Charles Valentin, Charles Valentine, Alcan, A L K A N. Is it true that Mozart would actually leave portions of the score blank so he could embellish on the spot for an audience? If so, what do you perform during that segment? Oh, yes, that is true. But that was a, a widely adopted convention in the Baroque and classical eras, especially if you're writing a concerto, uh, you will at a certain point, usually towards the end of the first movement, uh, the score will break off and you'll, you'll stop on a, on a dominant chord usually. And then there'll be what's called a cadenza, which is a, a, a virtuosic passage that's improvised or meant to be improvised, although very often, uh, performers would actually work out their cadenzas beforehand. They would write them out. But those passages are intended to show off the virtuosity of the performer and their ability to uh, to generate a musical idea extemporaneously. So, 
Beethoven also discouraged the performance of any of his quartets after Opus 74, of course, including all the late quartets. Do you think that Fabian's feeling about the cello pieces may be related? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting point. I think it comes out of a similar impulse. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for a composer uh, to feel misunderstood or to feel like the work that they care so much about is going to be greeted only with incomprehension. Like we have this kind of romantic vision of that now that that's, oh, that, you know, that's like a beautiful thing. It's not a beautiful thing. It's painful for the artist. Like they would much rather be understood than, than to be greeted with total incomprehension and, and insults. So I think Webern at that point, uh, he was still a relatively young artist and he'd had some very notable public failures. And I'm sure that that stung. I'm sure that was very hard for him. And uh, a lot of those, a lot of the artists in his circle had a very, uh, a very, um, what would you say, conflictual relationship with the Viennese public, which was nothing new, of course, because that was the case with Brahms as well. But they didn't enjoy that, you know. It wasn't like it wasn't fun to give a concert and have it end in 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 uh, rioting and scandal. So. But nevertheless, he wanted to write the music he wanted to write in the way he wanted to write it. And I think there's something of that message in a bottle attitude there. This idea that this, this is not music for today, it's music for the future. And one day people will appreciate it and they'll, they'll listen to it as though it were ordinary music in the same manner that they listen to Schubert. So that's, I think, what Webern's attitude was. Of course, it hasn't really come true. It's it's still not really considered to be quote unquote ordinary music for most people. It's still very much. Uh, but I think, nevertheless, though, I mean, there's very very significant progress that's been made, and those pieces do get played all the time, all over the world. They do have a substantial audience. They're very famous, and they get played with increasing amounts of sensitivity and skill. There's an amazing recording of the the uh, Opus 11 Webern pieces by Jean-Guyen Queyras, a Canadian cello player, and Alexandre Tarot, who is a, uh, who's a uh, quite a wonderful French pianist. And they just play those pieces so beautifully with such exquisite sensitivity and understanding and musicality. And it's, it's hard for me to see how, you know, an audience could be deaf to such beauty. But then again, people are surprising. Good morning, I just woke up in Queensland and found your stream. Well, hello to you. Good morning. What are your thoughts on American composers such as Charles Ives or Elliot Carter? Well, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm deeply admirative of, uh, of that strand within American musical life, extending back to the ultra moderns of the 1920s and 1930s. So people like Ruggles, Charles, uh, Carl Ruggles is, is uh, very important to me as an artist and Ruth Crawford Seeger, certainly. Um, Harry Parch, Morton Feldman, uh, Stefan Volpe also, who is a, a German immigrant, but uh, who had settled in New York. And there's just, just a long line of incredibly interesting, distinctive, unique artists that came out of America in the 20th century with this kind of amazing independence of spirit. Like a lot of them were uh, deliberately uh, distancing themselves from what was going on in Europe. And some of them were actually quite standoffish about that and, and determined to be, you know, the, to do their own thing and not to take into account what was fashionable in Berlin or Paris or whatever. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I love those artists. Definitely. And do you think it's possible to be a competent composer that does not play any instrument whatsoever? Yes, of course. It's actually surprisingly common. Lots of composers are uh, not instrumentalists or they can you know only play a little bit or not at a very good level i think if you can play an instrument it's probably an advantage it, it certainly 
it's it's in no sense a disadvantage to be able to do that. Let's put it that way. But not being able to play an instrument or not being able to play well is something that can be transcended, I think. The main thing though is, because I was an instrumentalist, I was an oboist for a long time. I don't really play anymore, but uh, I got quite a lot out of that experience. Among other things, the experience of playing in orchestras and chamber ensembles and playing as a soloist and learning how to play with other people, learning how to play under a conductor uh, and assimilating lots of repertoire in lots of different styles. All of those were really valuable experiences and they uh, immeasurably enriched my activity as a composer for sure. But, you know, it's extremely difficult to be both an active performer and a composer and to pursue those things simultaneously. It's really, really challenging. A few people are able to do that, but uh, you can see why it's not more common. And there are also very different skill sets in a certain sense too, because composers tend to, just the nature of the work, you know, you tend to be working in a solitary environment a lot of the time for very long stretches. You know, a piece could take six months or a year to write, and you might be sitting at a desk writing for most of that time. Whereas composer, uh, whereas performers are out there in front of an audience and performing and traveling and around people all the time. And there's a certain degree of extroversion that I think is part of that or needs to be part of that if you're going to pursue that, that sort of a career. And you can see that those are two different personality types to some extent. So sometimes they overlap, but often they don't. I like Romatelli. Yeah, I like Fausto Romatelli, interesting character. I don't know the music well enough. I've heard a bunch of it performed live and I've got, uh, I've got some CDs here, but I need to return to that at some point because he's a very, very in intriguing character for sure. Do you like the American or European classical music scene more? Well, I think they complement each other and they do, you know, they're, they're not identical, although they have many features in common and there's a, a lot of crossover between the two. In fact, uh, you know, it's not always easy to draw very clear distinctions between these scenes, so to speak, because a lot of Americans study in Europe and a lot of Europeans go and work in the US. So the main differences are probably just in the organization of public musical life. Uh, music tends to be, or at least composition tends to be more ensconced in the universities in North America. And in Europe, it tends to be more taught in conservatories, and those are actually quite different types of institutions. And I think they, they breed or they result in rather different musical scenes. But there are also many points of contact between the two. Any new upcoming album? Yes, I mentioned that at the beginning of this live stream. So if you're just joining us now, yes, I do have a new album coming out. There's a couple of videos about that on my YouTube channel. There's a behind the scenes video where I'm working in the studio. And if you haven't seen that, please check it out. It's just a two minute video that shows uh, me sitting in the studio with a recording engineer and the, and the musicians rehearsing a piece of mine. Anyway, where I'm currently in the process of mixing and mastering all of the tracks for the album. And I'm hoping it'll be out by about March, 2023 at the latest. And I will continue to share updates on that as the project is moving towards completion. What do you think of the music of Claude Vivier? Is there a lack of vocality in contemporary classical music? Well, those are two basically unrelated questions, I think. Uh, I like Vivier. I like him certainly as a, as a figure. He's very interesting. And he was clearly extremely gifted. You know, even the, the sort of secondary pieces of Vivier, things like Orion, the, or the orchestra piece, or his percussion pieces, uh, or his solo piano pieces. You know, even those are have got something interesting and distinctive about them. Vivier is also, but he, you know, I, I think, I think he's given slightly too much credit though for having invented a new style. Uh, certainly, by Ligeti, who is a huge Vivier fan, I think he overemphasized the extent to which Vivier was doing something uh, drastically new because Vivier actually came out of 
uh, Stockhausen's music of the 1970s, things like Inori in particular were a very, very major influence on him. And you can, you can see very similar textures uh, in pieces like Zipangu and uh, Lonely Child of Vivier, two things that Stockhausen was doing in the 70s, which is not to criticize those pieces or to detract from their quality because I think they're, they're very strong works. But, uh, but I also don't believe that he was uh, quite the pioneer that he's been, uh, he's been uh, laid out to be. Would you go to a publishing company as a young unknown composer and which things are they looking for? No, not necessarily. I mean, you have to be really clear if you're going into any kind of publishing venture, what it, what it is exactly that you're hoping to get out of it and, and what it is you're looking for. And so and there are multiple reasons why you might want to have a music publisher. Um, and then you have to think about what, re, you know, realistically speaking, what a publisher could actually do for you. And there are lots of smaller publishers that can't really do very much. They'll take a percentage of your royalties, but you won't get anything in, in exchange for that, except maybe some very basic services. So then you have to wonder if that's actually worth it or not, because uh, Composers don't have tons of, uh, of revenue streams necessarily, or at least most composers don't, and, and royalties are a big part of that. So you have to think carefully about whether you want to give away a portion of your earnings and what you would be getting in exchange. And you know, if you're getting tons of performances because they're doing a good job promoting your work, then, then it might be worth your while. But otherwise, you know, maybe you're better off self-publishing and posting the PDFs on a website. So, let's see. What are your opinions on the music of Hans Joachim Hespos? I personally love his music. Hmm. That's funny. See, I've got this on my desk. This was an article that was published uh, in the Neue Musik Zeitung recently about uh, Hespos on the occasion of his death. And uh, I tweeted about this article actually because I, I'm not a big fan of this sort of writing, not of Hespos, but of the, the way that he's being written about in the article. But yeah, he's a. Uh, I, I don't exactly know what I think about Hespos. He's 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 interesting, in in the sense that he's uh, he's such an extreme and radical figure. He's, his music is so strange and it has so many radically alien postulates to it that uh, you kind of can't help but be fascinated. I, I definitely think he's an interesting figure, and there are some pieces that I've really enjoyed by him. Uh, there aren't tons of recordings right now of his music, although I suspect that will change because there's lots of people who are interested in Hespos, so, so we'll see. It's definitely, you know, it's, it's very extreme, and uh, it's, it's also very much a product of its time. I'd be curious to see how the critical reception evolves, you know, in the coming decades, and, you know, if the uh, Hespos audience is able to broaden itself at all. So I'm gonna do one or two more questions and then I'm going to sign off. So let's see. It seems the internet is changing composing as much as it is changing pop slash rock, perhaps in ways with a different emphasis. Well, yes, definitely. It would be strange if the internet didn't have an effect on composition. That's for sure. It's definitely changing people's listening habits as well. Um, my suspicion is that it's resulting in a more rapid uh, integration of heterogeneous styles than might have been the case otherwise. It's probably hastening that process of just 
hugely opening up the range of things that can be done under the rubric of composition. You know, it's like in the internet age, it's, it's very hard to imagine something happening that would be analogous to the obsession with serial composition that overtook the American universities in the 1960s. You know, I, I just can't imagine how anything like that would uh, would be able to sustain itself. So it'd be really cool if the internet resulted in an explosion of really individual, interesting artists doing uh, highly idiosyncratic things and, and creating their own audiences. One thing that is, the, I think, a great promise of the internet and, and a truly revolutionary thing is composers might actually find that they have an audience for the first time. And I don't mean that facetiously. Um, if you look at the sorts of composers that have extensive institutional support and are played regularly in the sort of circuit of European festivals, uh, let's say, you know, over the past 50 or 60 years, um, in a certain sense, the audience that they have is a captive audience. It's an audience that belongs not to them, but to the festivals and to the institutions for whom they're writing. And I've noticed that at a lot of these festivals, in a certain sense, you know, for a, I would be willing to bet that for a majority of the audience, the names of the composers that are on the programs are basically interchangeable and that the, the people would be there regardless of who was being played. So in that sense, can you take X, Y, or Z composer and, and actually argue that they have an audience? I'm not sure you can in some cases. Some of them undeniably do have an audience, but I think a lot of them really don't. And the internet has the promise of changing that. And by an audience, I mean, you know, at least a few hundred people that remember who you are and have heard a, a few of your pieces and have some sense of what you are doing and are following your work and are interested in it and might even be willing to pay money to hear it. And, and not just sort of interested in the sort of let's say contemporary music generally. And so they'll, you know, they'll listen to the major releases from this or that label or whatever, but who are specifically interested in your work because there's something in it that speaks to them. I think the internet can quite dramatically help with that. You know, the greatest compliment you could pay an artist now, I think a composer would be to point out that they have an audience. So, That festival thing is also true of rock festivals. Yeah, I think it's true. I think that the the festival itself uh, uh, predominates over the individual artists, you know. And then you're there for the event, and you're not necessarily there for the specific artists. So it's very hard to to transcend that. Do you think nationalism is still a worthwhile cause in in modern composition? Well, that's an odd question. I'm not sure nationalism is ever really a, a worthwhile cause per se. If you, yeah, I, and I'm not sure how that relates to composition exactly. So this is going to be the last question I do because then I have to sign off. Do you have a favorite tone row? Well, probably, <laughs> that's such a funny question. So Webern was working on an Opus 32, which he never completed. Uh, there are a bunch of sketches for that that, have, that were published after his death. And uh, it was clear that I think even if he had lived, it would have been very difficult for him to complete that piece because of the cir circumstances he was in. But it's very curious. If you go and look at the sketches for Webern's Opus 32, it's just a chromatic scale. It's been chopped up into pieces and reordered, but it's just, you know, it's just semitones. And it's like, he's reduced the 12 tone idea down to just chromatic fragments, just little adjacent chromatic tones. Um, it'd be very funny to see what he would have done with that. And I suppose that's my favorite tone row because that piece was never written, and so you can kind of dream about what he might have done. 
So, okay, everybody, that's it for tonight. I'm going to sign off. And the last thing I'm going to say, if anyone is still here, is that I am doing Zoom teaching online. And uh, I've really been enjoying working with a lot of students from all over the world this way for the past few years. And it's been going really well. I really enjoy doing it. And if there's anybody out there who's interested in taking uh, composition or analysis lessons privately via Zoom, that is something I'm doing. And you can feel free to get in touch. My email address is on my website, samuelandreev.com. And you can write to me directly if you'd like to set up a time. And then I'm also going to repeat that uh, we are now very, very, very close to 50,000 subscribers. That's a major milestone for my channel. I'd really like to get there soon. I think we're just a few hundred away now. So, you know, spread the word. Don't uh, don't hesitate to tell people about the channel, get them to subscribe. I would be so pleased to get to 50,000. And I think we probably will in a, in a few days or a couple of weeks at the most. So there we go. Thanks everybody for watching. Thanks for the amazingly interesting questions. And I'm going to try to do this on a monthly basis. So with any luck, we'll see you again in a month. Okay. Cheers.